Welcome to uh, Council Time for Wednesday, March 30, 2022. Um, we have just completed a couple of very informative work sessions, and so now we move directly into Council Time. Uh, beginning with old business and the minutes for March 23rd, is there a motion for approval? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. 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 Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion is passed. Redistricting, item 1.2. So uh, this is the first um, council discussion again regarding the redistricting and the maps. Um, this is now with the council for your consideration. We have um, noticed a public hearing for the 13th of April at 830 in the morning uh, to discuss this, but there is um, a specific process. I don't know if Chris wants to go over that overview or if you want me to summarize it, um, but this is the first discussion for you guys to discuss redistricting maps. Would you like an overview of the process from Chris? Yes, or from you, whomever wishes to uh, proceed. Um, I have to apologize. I was in discussion with a couple of the other attorneys and I missed what process I <laughs> you're just it's the, it's just an overview of the redistricting process. Okay, and would you prefer to do that, Kathleen, or would you rather that I do that? You know, I can certainly do that and then you can fill in any gaps if that works. Great. Great. So the first thing that you have to do is um, draft a map and adopt the draft. And then within 10 days of that draft being adopted, there needs to be a public hearing. And the public hearing is specifically um, for the council to hear from the public in public comment, whether written or verbal public comment. Again, we do have that hearing set on the uh, 13th, um, so it would have to be within 10 days. This is outside the 10 days today, but we certainly have another council time next week, or you can add a special meeting as well. Um, after that hearing, seven days after, there has to be a public meeting that the council has to have in order to adopt the plan. This could actually be done on separate business during a council meeting. Um, and then if amended, instead of adopting at that time, then there would have to be another seven days or another week um, in order to take public written comment um, on the amendment prior to um, adopting it at a council meeting. So that's, um, did I miss anything, Chris? Go ahead. No, that was all correct. I just wanted to put a, a couple words in to maybe give a, a little gloss to the notion of adopting a draft. Um, the statute requires that you publish a draft. Um, it, by publishing a draft, you have not, in my opinion, um, given a preference for that plan. You're not saying this is what the county is, is going to do. It's just a starting point or something to look at. Um, personally and in my professional opinion it seems to me that a uh, one option for an appropriate draft would be the uh, map that was adopted by the voters with the charter amendments last november but the statute does not um, require that that be the case. So those are my thoughts uh, regarding, regarding the draft. And the draft, it, 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 when you look at the statutory process that, that Kathleen just explained, the purpose of the draft is to um, elicit public comment and council consideration. So uh, that's, 
I think what I would like you to keep in mind Chair, I have a clarifying question for current status. Yes, go ahead. Um, could uh, what is the map that is currently in effect? Given that we don't have we there, a, a new map has not been approved, what is the current operating map? Is it is what was in the question for me or for whom? Whomever can answer it. Uh, is it what was in the voters guide? Is it the districts that predated what was in the voters guide? Just want to make sure that we're very clear and publicly clear about what is currently in effect, even before we start talking about where we're going. Uh, our position is that it is the, the map that was in the voters guide. Prior to the vote in November, there were 4 districts, so it right. can't be that map. Okay, just wanted to make sure that we have that finite point marked. So, thank you. You're welcome. Also, just uh, make, Madam Chair, I'm oh, sorry. Were you done? Yes, go ahead, Councilor Olson. Yeah, thank you. I just from a from a process and timeline perspective, can we just walk through that one more time? So, if we were to publish a draft, how would that be done, and in what format would that be done? Is it council time? Is it a Tuesday meeting? And I know you had seven days, 30 days. I'm just trying to think about dates and kind of, I guess, maybe a more clear sense of the process and, and dates. Um, so, for adopting a draft that can be done at a council time or a special meeting of like another council time or work session presentation. Um, within 10 days of that, there needs to be a public hearing in order to take comment. And like I said, the public hearing right now is scheduled for the 13th. Of course, you can continue that if we're not ready by the 13th. You would not be able to adopt a draft today to meet that 10 line or 10 days for the 13th. So it would be next week on the the next council time next week. Uh, so does that make sense, Councillor? Yeah. So okay. next week we could potentially um, adopt a draft. Choose a draft, and then yes. the public hearing would be on the 13th to get feedback on that draft. Yes, and then um, seven days after that, there needs to be a public meeting to adopt to either one adopt a plan or to amend instead. So if you adopt the plan, that would be done at a Tuesday hearing on a separate business. It's not a separate public hearing. You could do a public hearing on that, but it could be adopted through separate business. If amended instead of adopting during that Tuesday meeting, then there would be another seven days in order to take written comments from the public on the amendment, and then it would go back to a Tuesday meeting for um, okay. adoption. So we we do the public hearing potentially then on the thirteenth. Within seven days, we schedule a meeting to either adopt the draft or amend the draft. Is that no? It has to be. At least seven days. Okay, so at least it's seven within days. ten from publication that you have the hearing, and then at least seven after that that you adopt or amend. Okay, um, and this statute is so convoluted; it helps to draw a picture of it. Yeah, if you want to understand. Yeah. Well, so so then, if you're saying, Kathleen, that that decision could be made during separate business at a Tuesday meeting um, and the council chooses to amend the map in some way or multiple ways, that could be a fairly lengthy process um, potentially. So I'm just trying to get my head around kind of at that point, if there's an amendment, then it's another minimum of seven days and we meet again. That's correct. Consider. Okay. That's correct. So comment slash questions. I, I see that uh, no one from the auditor's office is on. Uh, no one from the GIS office is on. I, we, so we actually do have uh, members of GIS that um, they were on earlier um, in case there were some technical questions. Yeah, so just in direction is I'm certainly really interested in being transparent through this whole process. Um, from my point of view, 
the issue with, and I, so I agree with Christine, first of all, that the map that the voters voted on is the map that's in existence right now. Uh, th that map that was in the voters guide, you know, had uh, population issues that uh, certainly were anticipated, but not uh, the, the depth of them wasn't known. And it also had uh, disparate impacts on some of, of a party and, and particular candidates. So uh, that map is, is troubled and does not comply with state law. Uh, we need to comply with every aspect of state law. So I guess my question then gets to be, because uh, I don't know the detail of A, B, or C. I understood that C may be problematic too. Uh, I think it potentially moves Julie Olson uh, into a different district. Um, I don't know that for sure. Uh, but I don't know which which map is less problematic to be our draft map, map whether it's A, B, or uh, uh, or some other map that we haven't seen yet. I mean, we have some constraints. We can't change. We have we can change no more than two percent, I think, of the population. And certainly, I don't want to get overly complicated. <laughs> I want to make as few changes as possible. So if I mean, it, it, do we have some input at this point as to which draft uh, might be the closest to complying with state law, you know, from compactness population, not negatively favoring or impacting a party or people, um, which, which draft that we, that has been dealt with that already exists, it would be the easiest to work with. Do we, is there an answer to that? So, Councillor Medvedi, I'm assuming you're asking again for a legal interpretation here, and uh, unfortunately, I I can't evaluate those drafts. There are a number of factors that go into them, and uh, I think the balancing of those factors is very important but balancing the factors is probably not something that I am comfortable doing. Um, that is, however, something for the council to consider before you decide what you're gonna call the statutory draft. But while we are on the subject, if I could go into charter section 6.6, .6, and you brought up a part of that, Councillor Medvigi. Um, you said that you can't change more than 2% of the population of a district. And I don't believe that that charter provision is applicable. What, the, what that provision says, if the council amends the committee's plan the amendment must be approved by an affirmative vote of two thirds of the council members and the area amended may not include more than 2% of the population of any council district. Now, I think what we heard from Judge Clark last week is that there is not a committee's map that is it just doesn't exist. The committee never adopted a map. And this charter provision refers only to the committee's map. It doesn't refer to the statutory draft and the statute, which is RCW 29A.76 at seek that's it's a 110 or i'm sorry 010 at seek um it doesn't refer to this two percent limitation at all so i don't think that you are constrained by that limit in the charter the charter did not contemplate in my view this circumstance 
and it does not refer to this circumstance. However, um, prudentially change, deciding to change as little as possible is certainly a policy decision that you are entitled to make. Chris, would you uh, please guide us through uh, in that process the number of votes that are required since how many votes are required has been an ongoing issue in yes. all of this at every level. But how many votes will be required from council, for example, in starting with the drafting of the mail? And then well, if you could carry us through that process after that as well. Yes, Chair Bowerman, I can uh, address that. Thank you. Um, so, as always, you're bound by the council's rules of procedure, which say that three votes are required to take an action. So, I, I think that's the starting point. If there is any uh, requirement beyond the three votes, it would come from either the charter or statute. Again, I do not believe that Charter Provision 6.6 .6 addresses this circumstance. It says, if the council amends the committee's plan, the amendment must be approved by an affirmative vote of two thirds of council members. There is no committee's plan Consequently, I do not think that this provision applies. So we then go to the statute and that does not have a two thirds majority requirement. Mm -hmm. So that leaves us with the rules of procedure, which require three votes for the council to take action. Mm -hmm. Assuming a Five member council, that would be three votes anyway. Assuming a four member council, it's still three votes. So I think that's where it is, but I don't think it's four votes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Just one more, uh, if I might, Chair. Um, so basically, Chris, I think what I'm hearing <laughs> is that we are starting over. So we have nothing. We are starting at the beginning, which I guess to your point earlier about a potential draft map being the charter map, whether that's what we do or not, I'm not suggesting it one way or the other, but that that's basically what you're what you're saying is we're starting over. It's all on us. We can and the map we have in place is the map from the election of November 2020. Is that accurate? And uh, yes, Councillor, you sorry. are bound by Chapter 29A76 of the RCW. So instead of thinking of starting over, you're starting. <laughs> so um, if, I can't see everybody for some reason. I need to change my parameters. I, I just thanks for that, Christine. And so I would amend my goal, which is just to make as few changes as possible and keep this as simple as possible. Uh, that may not be attainable, um, but going back then to uh, the question I had regarding the voter pamphlet map, A, B, or C, or some other, um, I guess one other question I'd throw out and mainly for Julie. Uh, so if, because I was personally starting to favor C the more I learned about it until we sent it back to redistricting. But subsequently, and I didn't, I'm not sure I know your address. Uh, subsequently, I heard that C might move you to five, District five. And so is that true or not true? And if it did move you to District five, is that something that puts you at a disadvantage or an advantage or impacts you in any way um, to kind of look at the statutory guidelines? So I, I think you're act, I think you're right in terms of map C. I also think map A, the map that they were looking at also puts me in district five. Um, and yeah, uh, so 
I think from my perspective, uh, whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage politically, who knows? It's difficult to say, you know, we run and we do our best. Um, but, you know, my thought process through this um, over the last month or so when we've been kind of dealing with this is, is it would be nice if um, council districts were consistent that we weren't all like there wasn't three councillors in one district based on the map that was adopted in November, um, that if we get to a redistricting plan, that we have an opportunity to respect the voters that voted for Councillor Bowerman in District 3 and respect the voters that voted for the charter, the new charter map in November um, and those that voted for me in District 2. So if there's a way to get to a map that, that does that, that meets the requirements of the statute, um, respects the voters that, that voted both in Councillor Bowerman's election and then in, in the the charter election last year. I think that would be my goal. Um, I don't know what that looks like um, in terms of precincts and populations and all that. But um, but yeah, I mean, now that we we're starting kind of anew, we have the opportunity to look at those. So, um, but from a advantage disadvantage standpoint, in terms of what district I'm in, it's difficult to say. Is the master on board with this discussion here today, right now? Because maybe he could answer that question. So he was the master for the redistricting committee. I don't know if he's considered a master for this process, um, but I do believe Paul is on who did support um, the redistricting committee. I should have said the the former master. <laughs> I, I tend to refer to it also as the former redistricting committee because it has gone back and forth. What is the answer to the question that Councillor Olson raised? Is there a map that exists that respects what she has outlined? Regarding the criteria mentioned, well, first of all, it's, it's good to see you all again. And uh, mm -hmm. yes, I believe Kathleen is correct. Uh, that uh, while I'm no longer the redistricting master, I am still uh, here to support uh, this process and in whatever way I can I can help. Um, regarding the the, the question, um, I let's see. When we drew the three alternatives, or I should say, uh, I I drew alternative B and C with the assistance of the committee and uh, A was from another source. Uh, but personally, I can say that I did not have knowledge of where counselors lived. So it was uh, with, without that knowledge. Uh, if that is appropriate for me to know, uh, then uh, we could move forward with that information while still trying to minimize change from the November ballot map and also balancing population. Well, are there maps that you have drawn in addition to ABC? No. Ah. So th there's a total of three, even though B is numbered two, it's, there's just right. one of them. Right, they were, um, there was an uh, alternative B and alternative B2. Uh, there was just a very minor change uh, between those. So same with A, there was a, uh, uh, there was an A and an A2, and again, just a very minor change. And the, uh, the former redistricting committee made minor changes, I understand, in maybe it was B2, I've forgotten now, um, very minor changes with the movement of a couple of precinct boundaries or something. It, has that been incorporated into the new map? It's or a B2, yes. A new map? <laughs> yes. Yes. We're it still has. calling it, we're still calling it B2. Uh, it was just a very minor, uh, actually the, we're still calling it B2 because the precincts that made up each district are the same. It was just such a small uh, discrepancy. Um, uh, still, I mean, significant enough to, to, to mention, but really the, the precincts precinct list, if you were to create a precinct list for each district, uh, there would be no change. Other questions I, from council? 
Well, I'd like Madam to Chair? respond. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Paul, could you talk about the process uh, and the thinking that you used when uh, developing the B and B2 map? Uh, my, I have an understanding uh, from watching uh, the, the redistricting committee meetings. Um, my thought was that that was largely an effort to update the map from uh, the, the voters guide and making some of those population adjustments while hewing closely to what was in the voters guide. Is that is is my understanding of that correct? Can you talk about that process? That is correct. Um, may I share my screen? Waiting for the button to be highlighted here. There we go. Stand by. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, this we is. Can. So I have all three maps here. Uh, A, and the question is pertaining to, uh, to alternative B2. And what I have here is the, uh, the shaded districts represent what was on the ballot in November. And then the bold blue lines represent an adjustment to uh, to what was on the ballot in November. Uh, so again, the goal here was to minimize the change while still balancing population. And as you see, the the uh, one moment. Right, so if you can see the table down here on the lower right, um, we have this column called the, the target population, which is really the, the total county population divided by five, five districts would be the ideal or the target population. Uh, with these changes, uh, we brought the, the deviation from that target, uh, you know, down very, very low, you know, within, um, I think highest was 188 people, which is very good, uh, considering 500,000 people in the county. And that those numbers are represented here uh, as labels. So District 4 is 136 people below the ideal target population and on around the around the map. So and again, with the, uh, the colored shading uh, representing the, the November map, uh, you can see the changes that were made. Thank you. Um, I uh, was interested in seeing this just because as, as uh, Councillor Olson was uh, talking about earlier, if we're wanting to do what we can to uh, respect as many voters wills as possible uh, th with this, uh, this adjusted map from the voters guide, uh, getting us close to all of the legal requirements with population and, and density and, and compactness and um, uh, respecting natural boundaries. If there are changes to this map that the council would want to make um, in order, like if, if there's an interest in protecting councilors in their, in their current districts um, in order to, as Councilor Olson said, respect the will of the voters that elected them, uh, I could certainly see this being a starting point uh, map for the council to review potential small changes. Um, I would I would be very supportive of the idea of following the spirit of the charter, even if we, as as Chris Cook said, don't necessarily need to because now we're operating under statute. Uh, I think trying to follow the spirit of the charter would be good if we could, as a council pick a draft, and if there are going to be tweaks, try our best to stay within that small percentage of change in order to do our best to respect the charter that the voters passed as well. And I think it's conceivable that that could be done by starting from this map. 
Uh, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd like to answer Paul's question and also respond to a couple of points just made by uh, Councillor Lentz, if I might. So I, I take some umbrage with the language protecting uh, the councillors, existing councillors. We shouldn't have to use that terminology. Um, the, additionally, I, so I don't think this is the map to follow uh, for a number of reasons, but I don't know that we've seen the map that we should use as the draft yet. I think that uh, it's really clear and it should be obvious to each of us that no voter, it wasn't an issue, it wasn't chimed up as a, a position for a statement in the proposition, or and there was no counter argument. No voter voted to uh, deliberately change uh, the district of any counselor. That wasn't an issue. That's not the voters' will. The voters' will was to break this up into five districts. Now, we, we don't any longer have the issue of three councillors in one district. Uh, and, but I think what we should do, since that wasn't a voter intent uh, in the Charter Amendment, uh, is we should return and maintain each of the councillors in the districts to which they were elected. Uh, I don't have any interest in moving any counselor. I mean, Councilor Lund should be in one, Julie should remain in two, Karen Bowerman should be in three, and I should be in four. And then number five will be whoever gets appointed uh, and ultimately uh, wins election uh, in the fall. So um, I don't, so to answer the question of Paul, yes, I think you should know uh, where the respective counselors resided prior to the Charter Amendment and reside uh, now, assuming they haven't moved. I don't know if anyone's moved. I knew that uh, Councillor uh, Quiring had moved uh, during some point in her term as uh, an at-large uh, counselor. Uh, so, and to be clear, I mean, that was gonna be an issue no matter what. I mean, she was gonna be in someone else's district once it was broken down to five districts. That was just gonna happen as a matter of course and may have been implied or known, uh, can be applied to be known by the public in voting for this change. Uh, but to put three into one uh, district was certainly not a stated intent or objective of any voter, uh, nor could it be implied. So I, is there a map uh, that retains each of the counselors in their districts with someone right now not representing five? I believe the answer to that was that um, we don't know, but that it could be investigated. Is that correct, Paul? Yes. Yeah. And I think that would be an in informative thing to do and um, the information can be provided to you uh, quickly. <laughs> yes. So I think that could be done uh by by you probably uh very rapidly yes so th there would be um a precinct a list of precincts that would be associated with each of these maps and maybe prior to us between now and next week um paul can do his work and we can look at the associated uh precincts with each map and that would provide some additional information if we were to to choose a draft map and then potentially make any amendments after we get public comment. So just a thought. And Madam Chair, may I interject, please? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, just to point out to the council and to the master or the former master, <laughs> Mr. Newman, um, <laughs> there are five criteria that are set forth in the statute as you all well know, but for the uh, sake of the public, um, there to be the districts are to be as nearly equal in population as possible. They're to be as compact as possible. 
They are to be geographically contiguous. Population data may not be used for purposes of favoring or disfavoring any racial group or political party. And then to the extent feasible, and if not inconsistent with the charter and so forth, uh, district boundaries are to coincide with existing recognized natural boundaries and to the extent possible, preserve existing communities of related and mutual interest. So those are the criteria that you are directed to observe in drawing, creating, and adopting your redistricting plan. I understand entirely what is being said about you know, people who formerly were in different districts being put into one district. But note that that's not a criterion. So when you adopt- in, in, your, in your, your opinion, Christine Cook, I think it is. Okay. Um, don't see it here. But when you, when you adopt your plan, make certain that you are referring to the criteria rather than to something that isn't a criterion. And I'll, I'll leave it there. When uh, we have a chance to uh, talk with Paul in greater depth, I, I sometimes look at this map and just wonder if we couldn't ask him some basic questions that would be helpful for our understanding. For example, in the, the word district three, there's a little jog up that pulls part of district four uh, into three. And I just kind of wonder why is that there when district three is above target and district four is below. I'm just giving that as an example of the kind of question that I think about when um, I'm looking at the way the lines are drawn to kind of keep neighborhoods together or whatever. That That is, I'm sure, done for some reason, but I, I sure wonder what some of those little jogs in the line are all about. Is right. that something that we could have a conversation with Paul about at the next meeting? Yes. Because that would that would, I think, help us to, because I I, uh, I have seen this on a very large map where you can see the streets and such, but now the, the lines are a little bit different. So uh, it's, it is always a game in flux. <sighs> uh, one, one short answer uh, to, the, to the question or the observation is that uh, our goal is to keep these boundaries aligned with precinct boundaries and precinct boundaries sometimes get curvy or uh, jaggy and uh, but so so some of the some of the kind of the rough portions of the line are that way because they're they're following established precinct boundaries. sure mm -hmm. makes sense and uh, maybe that's the situation there with three maybe that's a precinct that um extends on in to three somehow. I don't know. Right, right. This, I mean, this, this area, if you can see my mouse, that, that could be a, a single precinct. And it was just uh, because the, and the precincts have a population value, maybe it was, let's say it's 300. Um, so it was just a, uh, uh, a way to, to try to balance or, you know, pulling it in into district three, uh, provided better balance than leaving it in four. Mm -hmm. Bal balance in terms of population. Well, if we could have that just kind of discussion uh, next week, that would, I think, help us to understand a little bit better whichever draft we're going to be going with. So just, I hope we don't have an over-focus on it, though, because there are other locations between one and two and two and five. and. 
Uh, you look in the corner of battleground, southeast corner of battleground. I mean, there's so many irregularities um, mm -hmm. just based on all of the different criteria. And that's that's why I was objecting somewhat to uh, the conclusion on that one criteria for districts. You know, everything's related to one another from compactness to population uh, to not favoring or disfavoring a particular party or group. They're all interrelated. And you know, it would be great if we had perfectly uh, vertical and horizontal lines, but if we start focusing on all these different squiggles, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna get lost in the detail. How would you recommend, uh, Kathleen, that we get ready for next week's? discussion where we start uh, with a draft and put it before us so that we can say, is that going to be our draft? Well, council would have to give direction on what that draft is going to look like. I mean, you can choose, you know, the current, like you said, the current map that's in place or the ones that the former redistricting committee had looked at. If there are specific questions, um, to be looked at, it would be helpful to get that ahead of time um, so that staff has time to review and provide the feedback next week. Um, and then just keep in mind, you know, if the you can always do special meetings also, because next week is the last Wednesday prior to the, the scheduled hearing um, as well. So any questions that you have ahead of time, I think would be helpful. Um, so that we can provide it, or if you want to say right now, we want to start with the current map that's in place as our starting point as our first draft and start amending from there. Or if you want to look at 1 of these, I mean, you can certainly start drawing lines yourself um, as well. So, whatever you choose, um, I, the staff is not going to choose what the draft is going to be. They need that direction from the council. So, uh, Madam Chair, my proposal is what I stated before. I would like a map that respects the pre-existing districts of each counselor. So, the Paul would need to know uh, which PCO district each of us is in uh, or our address. And then uh, that would be our draft, you know, keeping all, uh, filing all other criteria because, again, that there was no voter initiative to change uh, counselors from one district to another. That was not part of the initiative. So uh, that is my suggestion, just adding that additional residence uh, issue and what districts pre-existed uh, for each of the existing counselors. And then that's where we would start to start working on all the other uh, compactness, population, uh, Every all the other criteria that the state sets. Well, whichever one that would be, we know it's not B two. Um, I don't I I don't know about C as it relates to others. Um, I think C does put me back in in uh, in three. If I recall correctly, it's been a while since we dealt with this. Um, Gary, it may put you in four. I'm not, I don't recall for sure. And I don't know where it puts Julie. <laughs> Do you C, see Julie? Puts in, C puts me in five, District five. Oh, but, in five. But to Councillor Membiji's point, if we looked at, I don't know, whatever the map was that we were just looking at before, I mean, if, if that's what Paul had to, to start with, it meets all the criteria of the RCW at this point. He could run the precinct analysis and whatever minor changes that he could make, yeah, whether it's this map or another map, I don't, I mean, this one seems the closest to, um, but whatever, you know, making sure we meet the, the requirements of the RCW <clears throat> and he just runs that up against the precincts. Um, Paul, is that something that would be manageable to present to us next week or something similar to that? So what I'm hearing is to start with I guess the, the map that was approved in November, but then start to make adjustments for population and also the residence location of, of each of the four counselors, as well as the additional RCW requirements. 
Is that is that what I understand or what I hear? Well, would it be what was approved by the voters or what is on the slide in front of us here, which does have a few changes? Yes, I could certainly. Yeah, starting here yeah. would probably provide a head start. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. You've already done the work on this one. It's no need. Okay. To... Yeah, so it. I think Councillor Olson and I are on the same page here, and, and as Paul restated it, um, the only other additional change I, I don't know where we get the nomenclature from but instead of a b two or c it starts starting starts to sound like covid variants let's go with draft one uh with and rename it and start with that as our draft that's i i think i hear at least two of us supporting that if we change numbers, it's going to be really confusing to people. Let's um, let's continue to call B2 something about B or 2 so we can follow this. Um, well, if I do start with B2, I uh, might propose that I call it B3. Uh, as, as, uh, as a, but I can do, I can name it, you know, naming things is one of the hardest things. <laughs> and uh, I'm I'm certainly amenable to to any any preference you may have. I admit, go ahead, so, Councilor Olson. I, I sort of agree with Councilor Mevaji on this one. It's sort of like this would be the council draft one. This would be our first draft. And and Paul, if in your brain you want it to call it B three, that's okay. But from a public <laughs> perspective, this is our first draft. Whatever Excellent. it turns out to be, that that would be my sort of thought process on it. <laughs> I will. We will all call it the same. <laughs> And it will be one. Draft one. So if you call, so it, there there was no B one, correct? B one was, or was that what was in the voters pamphlet? No, no, there were no uh, lettered. No, no B one. Okay. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So right, and and to thinking further, given that this is the council's effort. Yes, yeah, starting over with a new number uh, is appropriate. The you know the letters A, B, and C that was the effort of the redistricting committee, um, and this is a new effort, and so a new number, new numbering scheme. If we're going to call that one, please put in parentheses down there somewhere, or <laughs> those of us who get lost otherwise can see that you're real that you're also meaning B three. Well, I I, I will not use B three. I, I, I will be calling it one if you call it one. So let's we'll all okay. be on the same page. What worries me is that I've got in my head uh, what uh, A, B, and C were. And now to change them is, um, I'm not sure I can adapt uh, real clearly, but I'll give it my best shot. Sounds rough. <laughs> So, are we uh, pretty much ready to go? We just need to give give you the precincts um, in which we reside. Yes. And shall we do that by communicating them to uh, Kathleen? Yes, receiving them by email would be preferred. Okay, great. I kind of think we're ready to go for next week. Um, is there anything else that seems to you that we need to iron it out before next week? I think I'm set. What I will plan to have is a PDF map, uh, much like this. And also have a uh, kind of a live map. GIS uh, interface that can be used to show precincts and whatnot. Thank you for continuing with this uh, because I'm sure you didn't anticipate that this would go on for so long, but thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay, shall we move on then away from redistricting to talking about 
our meeting form for the future. Hybrid, in person, or continuing as is. Yes, um, Chair, if I may, um, we have been working with an outside contractor who knows our system in the hearing room and we'll have an update hopefully tomorrow that they will be expediting um, the technology changes we need to make. So it doesn't prohibit the council from doing hybrid now if you wanna come in, but I will let you know the way the sound system is on the dais. If anybody who is calling in remotely or through the computer, phone or computer, it is really hard to hear and understand while you're sitting on the dais. So that's the main concern um, for the council meetings and for you all coming in. And I'd be preferred to have that taken care of just because I don't think it's, um, I can't hear, I can't understand sitting up there just the way the sound system is working. OPMA still requires us that we have to provide the online and remote access for our community right now so that it's not an option to turn that off. Um, so I would recommend right now just to give me one more week and hopefully we'll have a better outcome um, next week and we'll, we'll be ready to uh, move forward with the hybrid and in person as the council wishes. Um, and also just for our other boards and commissions, they are, they're also following suit with the council decision. They do meet in the hearing room as well and they use a, a wireless mic and those microphones are not connected through CVTV, which provides some of the hybrid um, options as well or the remote access. So the contractor is working through that as well so that we can get both up and running. Madam Chair, I have a question of the manager. Yes. Yeah. So there was one meeting I actually came into and sat on the dais. I think I was the only one there for some reason. And I experienced exactly what you were saying. I couldn't hear a word. And I, I had to go back in my office and then get on the, my iPad uh, in order to participate. Um, and I, so I'm hard of hearing. And I think you all know that I'm very hard of hearing. So I'm very concerned about this. Um, you know, in my military experience, I was in a lot of places where we had simultaneous translation going on. Not always, um, but it was often, okay, don your headsets. So I'm thinking in terms of, I don't know what we would need. I don't remember seeing, I, I know we have mics at each of our seat locations on the dais. I don't remember that there was any uh, plug for a headset, but to me, that would be the solution. I don't know what the cost would be or how complicated it would be with the equipment we have there, but for, when we have people, uh, whether they're staff or uh, who are remote or the public who are making public comment, it would be simply a time of, okay, don your headsets and we could have it, you know, piped right in. Uh, so uh, I'm just, have we looked at that? Is that really costly? And what are the, what's the potential? That that may be an option moving forward, but I've already um, signed a PO to get the sound fixed in the hearing room. If it gets to, if it's not going to be fixed for a while, we can certainly look at doing earbuds or um, headsets as well. But it's it's the sound that comes down from the top through the remote system, um, and that we do have some headsets that we have that we can test, but. I'm hoping that they'll fix it. If it doesn't fix it the first round, we'll test our current headsets and see how that can help assist as well moving forward. Great. So next Tuesday, we will be discussing this again then? It'll be on Wednesday. We always Wednesday. have um, on the Wednesday council time, yes. Excellent, thank you. And next, external ARPA funding council representative. Yes, so the council did approve um, the external ARPA funding process um, for our local business partners and nonprofits to apply for grants through ARPA. Um, we do need a counselor to be a representative on that process. So the um, what that would include is having a meeting with the other stakeholders who will be Determining what the criteria is, that criteria will come back to the council for your review and approval, as well as reviewing any of the um, RFP proposals that come in through that process. 
for consideration um, for recommendation to the council. So this would just be one counselor that would be part of that team uh, reviewing the ARPA requests. Are there any counselors that have uh, volunteered with an interest in serving in this role? <laughs> I think what I had told Kathleen is if no one else volunteers, uh, I I would do it. it. It does sound like quite a bit of substantially uh, more of a time commitment and work. So I'm anxious to have another counselor volunteer. Well, but. I said somewhat something similar, but it uh, had a little different twist on it, Counselor Olson. It was that I would be willing to serve if no one else was willing, but I thought that Counselor Olson would be very good in that capacity. So I don't know what you think about that. And and I also can just share really quick on the 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 time frame. So Mark is um, auditor's office is leading this, and I think they're having the first meeting this Friday. But they do have some draft criteria already established to start that conversation with the group, since it has to meet the ARPA requirements as well. So I'm hopeful it's not going to be taking a lot of um, staff time or council time. So were you volunteering me, Chair Barman? <laughs> I yeah, I was. I I because I thought you would be quite good in that role based on our our work together on another group, where yeah. funds are dispersed. <laughs> yeah, my I mean I I have a concern just about bandwidth right now in um, work versus personal life still. So that would be my concern. I've got quite a bit of travel that I'm um, doing over the next I don't know what period of time. So that would be my concern about about doing the represent. I just have a lot of other stuff going on right now that's taking up some time. Understood. Yeah. Well, it sounds like your offer, Councillor Medvigi, is a good one. Okay, and then another hybrid alternative, since we are talking about hybrids constantly, is to have uh, a primary and an alternate or even co and switch off. I don't know if that would provide good or enough consistency, but uh, I'll leave it up to the other counselors. I haven't, Temple, have you any interest or bandwidth available? I have a similar bandwidth problem. So uh, feel free to uh, share as you as you so see fit. And and I can say, you know, a counselor doesn't have to be on it if if there is any concern with time commitment, and they'll still all be involved with their recommended parameters and evaluation criteria, as well as the uh, recommendations for granting funds, that will all come back to the full council. So if, if there is an issue with a counselor, I'm sure it's fine that they move forward with that one. So, uh, Madam Chair, I, I will volunteer with that caveat that perhaps uh, we won't be necessary all the time, um, but I there are certainly a number of projects that I'm very interested in seeing. Um, come before the committee and get favorable movement. So anyway, I'll I'll go ahead and volunteer. Thank you so much. I'm happy to serve as your as your backup, although we really need that district five person to start volunteering. <laughs> uh, let's turn to the next item, which is the ethics complaint. So, yes, uh, we did receive an ethics complaint um, regarding Councillor Olson. This is from a community member by the name of Mr. Uh, Rob Anderson. I have it, it, was re it was regarding Councillor Olson. I don't Lentz, think it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Olson Lentz. My apologies. Um, so, it was submitted. I have forwarded this to the council. It is up on your screen now and it's posted online. So, the council options that you have uh, with regarding to this is. Um, you can start an investigation right away. Um, you can delay until the ethics review commission, or if the council doesn't believe that it meets uh, the definition of ethics as defined by RCW, then that could be stated and it would be dismissed immediately. So um, I don't, if you have any other questions, we can certainly try to help um, provide some assistance. 
I would normally say let's do with uh, this complaint as as we have with others and have the council uh, decide here and now whether it does meet uh, with the RCW or not. However, in this case, since we have an ethics review commission that is going to be uh, coming up soon, it would seem proper for uh, them to uh, have this in their purview to make their determination on that. So that would be my suggestion, your number two, to refer it to the Ethics Review Commission when they begin to meet. I'm sure. Uh, I, yeah, obviously that's a possibility. I just, um, on the face of this particular complaint, I, I just don't think it meets the criteria, um, whether we decide or the Ethics Committee in the future decides, I just think it's pretty clear on its face that it, it doesn't meet an ethics violation. So I would like just to put this to rest and, and move on. Any other comments? Councilor Medvidji. Okay, so I have to admit, I was very challenged to um, read yet again another long, what I consider an email, in this case, a letter form from the particular uh, uh, constituent uh, that who had been somewhat very unkind in the whole process uh, to me personally, um, and, and, and meaning the mini initiative process. So I, I guess the simple answer is I haven't read it in detail. I read it, um, but the upshot of it is there's a lot of uh, facets to it that I think would benefit from the new committee. Uh, I don't have an opinion uh, that clearly that it does or does not comply. There are certain aspects of it uh, that certainly could uh, and, and may be worthy of discussion. Um, you know, some of the extracurricular activities of counselors as a counselor, using a title counselor, uh, criticizing votes um, of other counselors or criticizing other issues, you know, the substance of whether this mini initiative banned or didn't ban or created law um, contrary to the governor's um, mandates. You know, I, I think some of that is it's hard to understand. And from that perspective, I, I certainly would agree with Councilor Olson that, you know, the, the complaint has no merit or doesn't comply, not that it doesn't have merit, but that doesn't comply with the, uh, the definitions that we're in the process of adopting. So I, all in all, I think we're on the cusp of having this new process. I feel uncomfortable um, canceling another one. Uh, just uh, as we're about to start, we received some criticism when the first ones were, were offered and we basically said, that doesn't apply, we're not gonna hear it. Um, and so I, I don't think the public was very satisfied with that. So I, I'm hopeful, and that was my first question to Kathleen. How how soon uh, can we get this committee up and running? I mean, are we still talking many months? Is it many weeks, many days? I mean, I know once we adopt the rules, we still have to solicit and then accept or select, and that would be the county manager uh, selecting participants. So if it's if it's going to be way out to the future, I just as soon end it right now. If it's in the reasonable near term future, I just as soon have uh, the committee deal with it. Kathleen, um, do you have the RCW? I do know it's uh, 42, 42. Chris, if you can confirm that or Lindsay, I think it's 42. Chapter 42 of the RCW. Yeah, I just would like to somebody to read it. And we can pull it up quickly. Can you address the timing question that Councilman did you raise? Yes. Um, so I'll touch base with that as Lindsay or Chris look at the ethics um, RCW. So 
The code of ethics ordinance is on your hearing for next Tuesday, the 5th, um, pending public participation and comments. You know, if um, there isn't anything significant that the council wants to amend, it could be adopted then. And then that takes an effect, I believe, 10 days after. But um, as soon as that is adopted and approved by the council, then we will get out the solicitation for the committee members. I wanted to initially I was going to do it simultaneously, but because there has been conversation about qualifications, I wanted to make sure we were accurately reflecting what we're requesting. So that could go out on the 6th. It would be a 2 weeks um, solicitation out in the public, depending on the number of applicants that we receive. Um, it could be longer if we don't get enough or whatever. So that 6 takes you, I would say, to the 22nd to, of April, and then we'll have to schedule interviews that um, I will do with the applicants. So I anticipate if if it goes as quickly as possible, that would be on um, the, I would say to be safe, it would be on the May 17th um, agenda. Small possibility for the 3rd of May, but I want to be realistic because we've got a lot of stuff going on right now. So it's probably going to be May 17th before those are on the consent agenda. So, um, would you like me to chime in now about this RCW? It, it is indeed in uh, Title 42. There is a definition in um, Chapter 41, I'm sorry, 4241 of improper governmental action. And Kathleen, is that the definition that you are interested in? It is the one that says that, you know, what yes. defines ethics for an elected official or anybody working for the public, which is they can't do anything that has personal gain and that type of information. And I think mm -hmm. we had it referenced in our rules of procedure. As ah, well. I'd have okay. to refer that to Lindsay. Yes. Yeah, so it's a, it's an action by a local government officer or employee undertaken in performance of their official duties, whether it's in the scope of their uh, employment or not, and that violates any federal, state, or local law or rule, or is an abuse of authority, or is of substantial and specific danger to the public health or safety, or is a gross waste of public funds. So, to be a an improper governmental action, it would have to be one of those sorts of things. Violate a law, abuse authority, substantial and specific danger to public health or safety, or gross waste of public funds. So I would just reiterate that I don't believe this rises to the level of what's described in the law. Um, you know, in the politics is a <laughs> is a, a funny business, um, and we say things in as elected that the public and each other sometimes don't like. It doesn't mean it's an ethical violation. Yeah. Um, Sometimes uh, electeds behave in ways that you know we we've, we've witnessed it here, um, and but it doesn't mean it's an ethical violation. I think we, it's incumbent upon us to try to behave as as well as well as we can, as collegially as we can. And I think if we don't put this to rest now, it's just we've it looks inconsistent in terms of other ethical complaints that have been made against other counselors in the past that have not been um, reviewed in any level and to. to to send this on when on its face, it just doesn't meet the criteria. I just don't think that lends to this council working together in a better way that I think we all say we want to try to do. Um, so I would hope we just put this to rest today and, and it just doesn't, in my view, meet the level of the RCW. I uh, actually would be very comfortable with that, uh, Councilor Olson. The reason, uh, and I think I mentioned that at the, at the beginning of, of my comments earlier, I'd be comfortable uh, handling it in the way that we've handled the other complaints that have come to us in the past. 
Um, I note that it's already been a month and a half since the complaint uh, was sent to us. So my reasoning for uh, thinking that it would be a good alternative to send it to the ethics review committee is uh, because as being their first um, matter to deal with, it might get them in touch in a good way with what is really the difference between uh, professional uh, behavioral type concern versus ethics. And I would think that they would come to the same conclusion, but who knows that uh, it could perhaps even be referred uh, to the uh, professional group that is going to be uh, formulated as well for taking considerations. So that was my my only reason for suggesting that. But again, frankly, I'm comfortable either way. So I, I, I was trying to articulate pretty much exactly what you just said, Karen. I, I, and this uh, uh, this timeline that I, we've just been told from the first week of May to the third week of May, maybe we'll have uh, this committee constituted. That's certainly on the outside of uh, what I was hoping. Uh, and I'm not criticizing Kathleen. I, I understand the process, and that's how long it takes. But um, you know, I I prefer not to have uh, this complaint languishing, unheard for so long. Um, and I would agree with Councilor Olson that under that particular title and chapter of the RCW, on the face of the complaint, uh, which I read sufficiently, it doesn't seem to amount to that. Uh, but I think, you know, it would be good that that the committee hear it. And it, and I, it would also be really good that we don't just say we want to be collegial and work together uh, as a council, but to actually put that into action and start stop publicly using Facebook and other media to personally attack uh, the votes of other councilors. And I, I think that's with a council of five, uh, that's really absurd because um, it makes it really hard to work together. And so at some point, that's where you start pushing into the ethics area uh, where you're trying to bully your fellow counselors or ridicule them publicly within uh, your own media announcements, um, which I am very against. I don't think it's helpful at all. It's probably the most divisive thing uh, any of the counselors have done uh, over the last few years that I've been here. Uh, so I, if if the chair is willing to uh, have a vote on it today and, and remove it from this new committee that's not yet formed, it's just a matter of bad timing. Um, and I would, I would certainly agree to end it uh, today. Uh, and then with my heartfelt hopes that we could all actually not just say that we're going to collegially try to work together, but actually do that. Uh, I would like to have a motion on this one. I think it would be appropriate. Uh, and we've got three possibilities uh, before us. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I would move, yes. that, I would move that, that the council determine that this complaint does not meet the criteria of an ethics violation. Second. I am not hearing a second. That motion dies. Is there another motion? This is an interesting situation. <laughs> Um, may, I, may I may I make may I make the motion one more time? <laughs> yes, please go ahead. I would, I, would, I would move that we that the council consider this ethics complaint that it does not meet the the standard for an ethics violation. Is there a second? Uh, 
Chair, I have uh, been avoiding weighing in because I, while I don't believe there is anything in statute or charter that precludes me from voting in this matter, I would prefer to abstain. Um, if you need a second for the purpose of discussion, I will be a second, though I will say that I, unless I, you know, the vote is needed, I would prefer to abstain. I'd, I'd actually uh, applaud Count, Councillor Lentz if, if we could hear from her on this motion. I mean, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are. I mean, <laughs> how do you, are you going to continue with these videos? I mean, do you see no uh, connection with your ethical relationship with um, I think that the discussion counselor? about this particular motion should be about this particular motion. If you'd like to have a conversation with me, Councillor Medvedji, about how I communicate publicly, you have my phone number. Uh, I suggest that we keep this conversation related to this specific complaint at this, at this moment. And at this point, we don't have a second anyway for um, continuing the, di the discussion. I, I think what I'll do is try a different motion, and that is uh, that I move to uh, refer uh, this particular ethics complaint to the Ethics Review Committee when it is formed. I'll second that motion. Okay, now let's have discussion on that motion. Uh, you know, we, just had, we just had a charter amendment. The people spoke. They want this process put in place. Uh, we're putting it in place. We have one pending uh, complaint. I'd like to uh, follow the will of the people and have them hear it. Are uh, we ready to vote? I, if you, if I might, just one more. Um, yes, of course. I actually, this is really, this is really disappointing because <laughs> while we sit here and talk about how we treat each other, this, I, this could have been an olive branch. This could have been the first step to say, you know what, we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to be honest about, about the fact that this doesn't meet the criteria and we move on, but it looks like it's not going to happen. And, um, and, and it makes me, it's disappointing because we could have an opportunity here to, um, to maybe move to a next level in terms of our relationship with each other and moving this on and not just getting it over with today, I don't think helps. And I think given the process that has taken place with other violations, other, other um, accusations, I just think this is inconsistent and, um, and it's just really disappointing to me. Yeah, and, and so as to that tone and defiance just expressed by Councillor Lentz with, when I asked the question uh, kind of pushes me to want to Put it before a committee and have them deal with it. Yeah, but Councillor Manbuji, those are not. This is not an ethics violation. This is about about respect for each other and the way we do our work. And there's a difference. And that's just what I'm trying to get to. Is we could individually do a better job. And I and 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 frankly, you know, just this conversation with you and Councillor Lynch today doesn't add to that congeniality that you say you want. And so. Um, so behavior is not an ethical violation. And that's just, I'm trying to, that's the message I'm trying to, to communicate. And that, and by taking these actions, it doesn't do anything to, to, um, to further any these professional relationships. I, one of the reasons why, again, I, I made that motion is it deals with how we handle not, not just this request, but any request of ethics violation in the future that comes to us, I really don't see it as the council's prerogative to make a decision each and every time on yes, there is or no, this isn't an ethics violation. Um, if that were our role, it would change things, I think, pretty dramatically from what was envisioned as I understand it. Uh, by the, the the charter amendment with the creation of this group. So the idea of having uh, them evaluate it, the only reason that that wasn't done before is because there was not an ethics review body in, in process that would have been ready to meet within a month and a half or two. So that's the reason 
why this one would be different in my opinion, the only reason as a matter of fact. Any other comments or are we ready to vote? The motion before us is to move this ethics complaint to uh, the future ethics review committee. Or is it a commission? Ethics review. I believe it's commission. Commission. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. So the vote is two to one and for an affirmative position on something, we again need three votes, correct? So uh, is there another motion? Well, it sounds like there's no action, so it'll remain pending until we have the committee formed. I could move again that we dismiss this as not meeting the criteria. <laughs> <laughs> and we have been there and done that. So, <laughs> well, I, I do believe it, it is, there is no action uh, that is possible on it um, right now with the, the makeup of the group. And um, Councillor Lentz, I appreciate your abstaining in this situation. It, it does seem appropriate. It feels appropriate. I just want to acknowledge that. Yeah. Thanks council chair. I'd um, like a moment if I could. Um, okay. First, I want to say that uh, uh, I believe that this complaint has no merit. Um, so I uh, agree with Councillor Olson's position on that and think it should have been dismissed here. Um, I also have no concern about it advancing to the future ethics commission eventually again because it has no merit um so when eventually that may happen we'll deal with it then i i uh, do want to say that freedom of speech does not go away when one assumes elected office and with regard to this complaint and others that came in um, about another counselor some months ago, I also agreed with the majority opinion that those complaints had no merit with regard to an ethics violation. Uh, not liking what someone has to say doesn't make it unethical for them to say it. Um, not liking how one chooses to communicate doesn't make that method of communication unethical or even inappropriate. I wish this conversation had gone a different way because I do believe that the, the request to um, have some counselors not show defiance uh, or to come in line and be collegial is a request that has gone one way and it should go both ways. We should all be working toward that and to demand compliance of one without taking stock of one's own behaviors and actions. Uh, it doesn't move us forward. So uh, I welcome conversations. Uh, they don't necessarily need to be in the public square. You do have my number. Um, I'd be happy to chat about it, but uh, for this conversation and for future conversations, um, asking for respect also demands respect. Thank you. Okay, we will move now to the next agenda item, which is a proclamation request uh, called the National Healthcare Decisions Day. Um, and uh, Lindsay, is this under um, your domain? Sure, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, so this is a request that we received from the Commission on Aging. 
um, that would designate uh, April 16th as Healthcare Decisions Day. Um, you can see the text there, but it really is regarding um, encouraging people to have an advanced healthcare directive um, so that they can plan ahead for uh, those things none of us like to think about, but unfortunately happen to so many of us. So uh, encouraging folks to take a look at that and do the work to plan ahead um, and raise awareness of the issue. So happy to answer any questions. Are there any comments on this? I am just struck by the timing of this particular um, item for us now. Um, I'm sorry, I can't turn that phone off. Um, in that Oregon's assisted death um, proclamation or whatever it is to include people from uh, other states in their activity now, um, it, it, the timing uh, seems odd to me. And I think one of the reasons why that hit me is much as I personally support the idea of having an advanced directive and whatever uh, uh, decisions uh, a person wants to make personally, to call it a healthcare decision day is an odd name of this activity for me. Is, is there a particular reason why it's called that? I don't have the answer for that. Um, I can do some looking and see. Maybe there's a, a better name. So it's actually, now that I'm looking at it, it's actually National Healthcare Decisions Day. Yeah. April 16th. So I'm not sure what the impetus uh, or the origination for designating it that would be, but that's where it's coming from, from the Commission on Aging, is that it is a national uh, healthcare decisions day. And it's been held on April 16th for 12 years. Um, it was chosen because it's the day after tax day. Um, and it's usually a good day to discuss one's wishes. I'm not sure <laughs> what the origination of that idea is. Um, but that's what I'm seeing from the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization. Hmm. So it's linked somehow with our taxation day. I guess in, in some ways, similar to when we change the clocks, we change our smoke detector batteries. Maybe you think about one and think about something else. I'm not sure. Yeah, I can do some research and find out, but I probably won't be able to find out in the next few seconds. If there is a, a, a different name for it, that might be a, a little bit uh, more removed from what Oregon's decisions have been, I could be personally more comfortable with that. Isn't it National Healthcare Decisions Day? I mean, that's the name of the day that the proclamation is <clears throat> supporting. Um, I, I, would, I would be in favor of the proclamation um, I, I, the irony of what's happening in Oregon, I think, might just be that coincidental. I don't know. Um, but, yeah. I, I guess uh, I've never heard of the national uh, day by that name, and maybe that's a part of the problem. And you said it's been going on for years. It's been going on nationally for 12 years um, in my time in the council. We haven't done this 1, so at least not since 2018. But. I, I would be supportive of, of moving this forward. I think that the proc like as a, as something standing alone, the proclamation itself, I think it is good. Um, I hear what you're saying. Uh, Chair Bowerman about the, the name of the day. I, uh, um. If it's the day, it's one of these things. If these organizations are coming forward and saying, "Please honor our day," I don't know that it's in our purview, or I don't know that we should try to change the name. I could see, for the purposes of our proclamation, adding National Healthcare Decisions Day to the day that we call it, so that it's clear that it's a national effort. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't know that that directly addresses your concern, but it at least sort of. Um, ties it to that to that national national effort. Mm -hmm. I just uh, Googled it out of curiosity and um, I'm I'm not seeing uh, that longitudinal 
commitment uh, to that particular name. Um, so, uh, yeah, if, if we could uh, definitely reference the National Healthcare Decisions Day, uh, that would be good. There's something about five wishes that are involved here, um, which I, I don't know. It's a person-centered advanced care planning program, apparently, um, with free buttons, stickers, balloons, and include your own branding. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm fine with it if we reference the national day. You know, the importance of the resolution for anyone that has been in this process of suddenly having someone uh, become incompetent for their own healthcare decisions knows that that is not the time uh, to deal with these issues. So the reason for this proclamation is for people to actually think about it and get these uh, documents signed and in place so that when you're going through the misery of watching a loved one uh, die, uh, that decisions are already made uh, at a time when when there isn't such an emotionally overwhelming experience. So I, I think we should do it. I think we should publicize it. There's It's a noble cause. It's a worthy cause. And unfortunately, uh, every family at some level at some point has to deal with these issues. Uh, so, so again, it's best to think about it and do it ahead of time. So I, I would like to see the proclamation read. We can just refer to it as the national uh, naming nomenclature. It it is shocking in the third whereas where it says it states that fifty percent of uh, severely or terminally ill patients is all that have an advanced directive. That's really low. So I I know at some hospitals it is encouraged uh, with the people who are terminally ill, it's checked whether or not they have one and they're given the form for doing it if uh, if they don't have one. And uh, that's not a bad practice either. I, I don't know the extent to which that's done in Washington. But anyway, I think you have what you need if you'll call it the National Healthcare Decisions Day we're good to go. Um, we now move into executive session. So there are two items before us that will take approximately 30 minutes. Uh, Chair uh, yes. Um, I do have one policy thing. I don't know if there are any council reports. I don't want to jump ahead, but I do have one policy item that I need to discuss. You know, go right ahead. It, it, I it printed out the agenda from online and it wasn't on that agenda. And I apologize for that. I didn't nope. see what is up here before us. Go nope. ahead, Lindsay. Um, so I sent to each of you uh, and the uh, congressional earmark requests, the application form drafts. Um, and I need to submit those no later than Monday. And so wanted to see if there are any feedback input changes that you would like to make to those. Um, I did receive the forms also for um, Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler's office. So I will be submitting the request to all three of our congressional delegation members. Um, but I sent out the application. They're all relatively the same um, in terms of content. So I would use the same content for all um, all three of our delegation members for both the Vancouver Lake and the Third Bridge Corridor application. So um, happy to answer questions about that or if there are any changes that you want to make. Otherwise, I will get those submitted. Hearing none, go right ahead with the submission and thank you. Okay, I will do so. Thank you. I'll uh, back up. Um, you know, it's interesting what was uh, online here under uh, meetings of uh, the agenda. Um, it didn't have the, the counselor reports or I certainly would not have skipped over those. Um, are there any counselor reports at this time? 
I just wanted to briefly announce that the, uh, for anyone that's following the process, the RFP for Lake Vancouver is out on the streets uh, as a result of the earmark from Senator Cleveland and, and the support that she's given uh, on this project. Any additional ones? How about work session requests? There are no requests this morning. Okay. And Lindsay, have you covered the waterfront for your uh, policy issues? Yes, I'm done today. Thank you. Okay, great. And now it's time for that executive session, taking about 30 minutes with um, one involving pending litigation authorized by RCW 42.30. Uh, point 0.110, section 1I, that one uh, council will be present. And will we be reporting out? There is no action um, on that item this morning. Very good. And then also collective bargaining for 10 minutes. Um, will council be present for that particular item? Yes, they will be, and there's no they action will? on that as well. Yes. Okay, very good. So um, we will uh, go back to that executive session now and return here at about 1237. Thank you all. Attention everyone. The council has announced that they need about 10 more minutes. We'll be back at about 1248. Thank you. So if we could. We are back at uh, council time, having concluded the two executive sessions. There is no action to be taken at this time. And so this meeting is now adjourned.